does this not provide us an opportunity to think about de-escalation when you're thinking about what to go to next and the individuals who have done very well? I think that's right, Fred. I think there's a couple of groups of patients who are particularly attractive to treat with cladribine. So one is perhaps the patients who are more treatment experienced or older or have a higher EDSS score. This medicine may be a nice exit strategy from disease modifying treatment without the concerns that you have with other agents about inducing rebound or severe disease reactivation when medication is, is stopped. And um, I think another particularly attractive group of patients to treat uh, young women, um, as we've heard already, we have an increasing number of uh, treatment options uh, that facilitate family planning, but I think this is a particularly good option in that uh, women are able to fall pregnant uh, 18 months after starting the, the therapy. If they complete both courses of treatment and then wait six months, then they're free to start trying for a baby. So Patricia, the Europeans were ahead of us on this one and have more experience, but what are your thoughts about hydrogen? So I think it's very interesting. I think we're looking in the United States at, at what exactly is the role for oral cladribin. I think about it as a fairly high efficacy agent, higher than the other orals, maybe a step below the monoclonal antibodies. And it's an induction immune reconstitution agent. So as noted, very appealing to work pregnancy around that, very appealing to people that like the idea of taking short courses and having a prolonged drug-free period. There were some very respected MS neurologists who used parenteral cladribin off-label over the years. They would redose periodically, and they felt that this was very successful. To me, the most uh, unsteady um, kind of disconcerting thing is this uh, treat for the specific two courses and then don't treat again we have to come to some resolution. So I'm hoping that we get valuable data from Europe to really guide us since they're about a year and a half ahead of us. I, th I think we all feel comfortable though, Patricia, in, in patients treated with alemtuzumab, just, just to monitor patients because we know from the long-term follow-up of the CARE-MS1 and CARE-MS2 study that this treatment paradigm of giving uh, short course pulsed immune reconstitution therapy can bring about a lasting remission for a, a good proportion of people, at least for alemtuzumab and perhaps for cladribine also. Absolutely. You have some data for alemtuzumab, but do you have that data for cladribine? No, and that's what we need to collect. Yeah. And, and you're using cladribine first line in Europe? Yes, that, that's right. So at our center, it's roughly half of patients we treat. Uh, it's patients who are first line. Generally, those with more active MS, as Sven described earlier, two relapses in the previous 12 months. Uh, and then the other half of, of, of patients are people who've had ongoing disease activity on a previous uh, treatment. It's interesting to note that in the, in, uh, in the UK now, cladribine is now the number one uh, medicine for uh, first switches. So people um, switching from their first DMT to another uh, therapy, cladribine is now um, the, the, the front runner in, in that, that particular race. Interesting. So in the U.S., you know, there was a relabeling uh, of the drugs that occurred um, after uh, the saponimod approval, where all the disease-modifying therapies for relapsing disease were relabeled to include clinically isolated syndrome, relapsed remitting MS, and secondary progressive MS with activity. We can come back to the issues with that labeling characterization, of which there's quite a few um, later. Um, but cladribine, which actually had a study in clinically isolated syndrome, uh, which many of the others did not, was excluded from including clinically isolated syndrome in their label, uh, as was alemtizumab. Um, any thoughts on that, Patricia? Well, I think it doesn't make sense that cladribine, which had uh, what looked like a very positive CIS trial, was excluded. It was excluded strictly because they're saying we're concerned about malignancy issues, but it got approved in the U.S. because they weren't so concerned about malignancy issues. I mean, this was on schedule to be the first approved oral agent, and it wasn't. 
it wound up ultimately getting approved because it didn't overtly cause major cancer concerns. So it's quite puzzling to me. It doesn't make sense. Okay. Uh, and on that safety concern, have any safety concerns arisen in Europe uh, over the time you've been using it? Anything new? I mean, we have um, some patients around 10% um, reporting fatigue while they are taking the medication, which is a transient phenomenon. And we have some how higher rates of herpes infections compared uh, to the Clarity trial. But, but this is basically it, I have to say. There was one, um, one herpes encephalitis uh, reported as maybe a, a major side effect, but this could also be treated with IV, a cyclovir treatment. So, so far, it's quite safe, I have to say.